welcome back to the 2024 Elizabeth and Erwin Warren Foucault Symposium. The picture is still out there, reframing Black presence in the collections of early American art and material culture. It's my pleasure to be back. And uh, thank you for joining us for the second part of today's program. Ooh, next slide, please. Um, this afternoon, we will hear from um, exhibition co-creators, Emily Givalt, curatorial chair for collections and curator of folk art at the American Folk Art Museum, and Dr. Ariel Watson, assistant professor of English and African American studies at Lake Forest College, and Shade Ayurinde, a Terra Foundation pre-doctoral fellow in American art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, who recently served as Warren Family Assistant Curator at the American Folk Art Museum. Welcome back, Shadi. Um, in this uh, program, speakers will discuss uh, various methodologies used in the exhibition and name figures to assert Black presence through early material culture. This program will give also the co-creators the opportunity to share additional thoughts on creating the show and on the visitor's experience. As a quick reminder, closed captioning is available by activating the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Again, there will be time for Q&A with everyone at the end of the panel. So please share your questions for our speaker throughout the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And now I'll hand it over to Emily, RL, and Shade. Please, a warm welcome to this exceptional team. Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. We're so happy to have this opportunity to be in conversation with one another again, um, as believe it or not, we're coming to the end of the run of Unknown Figures uh, in New York City. Although for those of you who are not aware, the show will be traveling to historic Deerfield. Um, so you can catch the exhibition there <clears throat> and a new installation opening on May 2nd and closing, I believe, on August 4th. Um, but yeah, Ariel, do you want to start us off? Um, we're going to uh, take you through a little bit of a behind the scenes look at how we made certain um, decisions during the course of, of curating the exhibition, but also how our thinking has evolved about certain works of art in the show um, as we've interacted with scholars and visitors. Um, and uh, yeah, so you'll get a closer look at a number of different case studies from within the exhibition checklist. Okay, I did unmute myself. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this has really been quite a treat. Um, this morning's panel, uh, quite fabulous. I'm delighted um, to be able to hear from such excellent scholars. One of the things that um, comes along with demanding something new is often a discovery that there are things that were already there. Um, and those things um, that are already there, I think, uh, serve to, um, if not chastise us, maybe, you know, poke us a little bit like, hey, we've been here the whole time. Uh, but um, I'm delighted that, that uh, so many folks have you know, taken an interest um, even over the last decades, but, um, you know, we can go as far back as we want to go in terms of an attempt to find a true identity uh, in America um, for Black folk um, in light of the, the um, uh, erosion, uh, often intentional erosion of the archive. So, one of the things that I did in fact consider when I was um, uh, thinking about what would the experience of seeing some of these images be for a person. And as I often do, I went to uh, look at what Bell Hooks had to say uh, about representation, about envisioning um, different audiences uh, for works. And so, Bell Hooks talks about something called the oppositional gaze. Um, and this is something that uh, she derives from the testimonies of Black women um, who would go to theaters, would go to see art, would go to encounter culture, and would discover 
um, more malignant representations there of blackness, of black people, of themselves. And so um, had to develop a way to look at these images, um, had to develop a way to look at um, cultural production in a, in a, not just in a passive way, accepting what is being presented to them, but also challenging, questioning, and even opposing uh, what is being presented. Um, and so that was really the, uh, the ethic of regarding that um, you know, really spoke to me as we were thinking about a lot of these images. Um, so I would like to uh, turn it over now because we're going to talk about some of the methodological strategies that were going to be necessary for us uh, as folks who are trying to find something new in, in things that are old and things that seem to be settled questions. Uh, and so our strategies had to really uh, reflect that desire to uncover new things. And so I will pass it now uh, to my co-curator, Emily Javalt, who, uh, uh, who will start us off um, on, the, on the nitty gritty of this discussion. Yeah, yeah, thank you, RL. And I think that the, the methodology of the oppositional gaze has been such a fruitful and important um, kind of theoretical framework for us to think about in the course of the show, but also to make that um, legible and digestible for a general uh, a general audience. Um, I have been using this particular picture, which is right at the entrance to the galleries, quite a bit to um, encourage folks that this is a show where we've we are asking people to engage in that kind of critical thinking and the um, you know asking surprising perhaps questions of what they're seeing and to look not only at what is on the canvas uh, in front of you but also to think about what's not being represented and so <clears throat> talking about how using an image like this to start the show might be surprising because there are no black representations anywhere in this scene which is a retrospective image of Marblehead in the 19th century. Um, this artist often looked back at his 19th century boyhood. Um, so we only see white marble headers in this scene, but we also, um, as we as we uh, inquire about the picture in and what it is not showing, um, <clears throat> we can start to realize the ways in which it is evoking uh, Black histories through so many different cues. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Marblehead is a, uh, uh, was a very wealthy old New England town north of Boston, which um, like much of New England and, and other places in the north really drew its wealth from the uh, maritime activities of the triangle trade. So that image that Alexandra Chan shared at the beginning of her presentation with the kind of typical uh, nostalgic image of ye old New England resting on the labor of an enslaved man, I think is really appropriate in the case of a work like this, which seems to be a simple, um, peaceful depiction, but in the way that it's wrapped around the harbor at Marblehead, it's showing all of these ships. It's also showing fish flakes, which if you can see um, my cursor here, I'm circling some of these different drying racks for salt cod, which of course was a key commodity. Uh, in addition to the ships that were being built in Massachusetts at this time um, for the trading of enslaved people. And so uh, things like salt cod would um, would travel, uh, travel to Europe um, where the proceeds from them would facilitate the purchase of enslaved people from Africa who would then be brought to the West Indies where lower quality salt cod was being used as um, as food for um, enslaved laborers. Um, what's also, I think, really important to recognize about a scene like this is that we're also seeing um, how the artist does not seem to think that it is, is uh, there were absolutely Black neighbors who he would have been living alongside. The artist chooses not to depict any. So he's, he's playing his own um, part in this kind of, um, in this uh, a visual uh, represent lack of representation, um, he at one point actually does depict a black couple who were um, uh, important members of the community of Marblehead in the 19th century. That picture has now been lost. Um, we are only uh, left with examples of his work that that feature exclusively white figures. 
Um, but, uh, you know, can we use this image as a starting point to talk about um, the contributions to their communities of early Black New Englanders? Um, another example at the beginning of the show that has been really important for talking about this idea of, of of demanding something new from these old pictures. And I think I'll just, as an aside note, I think that's an especially um, important way to put that a frame of inquiry, because I think in so many exhibitions about African-American history, you see contemporary works of art being really leaned on to do the work of, um, of representing Black lives. And with this show, we actually grappled with that quite a bit. And we thought, do we want to include contemporary work? And we ultimately decided with the help of our uh, scholarly advisors that we preferred not to do that. We really wanted to place the pressure on the historical works of art and to say, this is possible. We can do this by looking back at these work, works and asking different questions. So in the case of these pictures of the Perry Hall plantation north of Baltimore, um, we see a very typical mode of painting at that time, a kind of a house portrait, which features uh, various different white members of the Guff family strolling leisurely through their lands. Again, what we do not see are all of the Black men, women, and children responsible for maintaining this landscape. Um, but when we place that work in conversation with another of the same plantation landscape, but looking from an alternate perspective, what we're seeing here are agricultural buildings at that same plantation, perhaps enslaved residences in the background here, and uh, laborers, both black and white, uh, working in the fields here. Um, and so, <clears throat> uh, you know, this is an extraordinary opportunity. This is this is this is really one of the only existing case studies where we can really see. Uh, the artist engaging in this kind of questioning of, well, what, what is happening uh, in the less sort of traditionally, uh, the tradition, the less traditional area of focus. Um, usually these are the kinds of pictures, these are the only kinds of pictures that we see. Um, this artist uh, makes an unusual decision, but we also see in the history of ownership of this work, <clears throat> kind of a key to the idea of bell hooks as oppositional gaze. This work did not descend with the white Guff family. It descends with the Hall family who had previously been enslaved by the Guffs and perhaps may have had genealogical relationships to them as well. So how does that understand our, how does that uh, uh, reshape our understanding of um, a work of art like this to know that it doesn't only signify in the moment of its creation, uh, it continues to have meaning and to hold potentially different meaning for different folks, um, a, perhaps a very different meaning for the, the free Black Baltimoreans who hung this work on their parlor walls. Um, and these are some examples of uh, photographs from the show, uh, descendants of the Hall family who had been enslaved at Perry Hall. And so by coupling these works together, we see how um, a new kind of narrative can unfold, a narrative of Black genealogy through these pictures that were originally intended in the case of these landscapes we've been looking at solely to uplift the white landowning family. Um, so I think those are some good case studies in the show of how this kind of work can be successful. But RL, do you want to take, do you want to talk a bit about this one? Indeed. So um, this uh, piece of work, this Prudence Punderson, uh, is actually quite unique. Um, it is giving us a um, set of three moments in time. And we can see on the left hand, we see the coffin that the, has the PP upon it, uh, that is giving us the idea of, of death, the death um, of the artist. We have her pictured in the middle in the act of uh, making art. Um, and we see um, this uh, as a full room. So even as we move from the left to the center, we are seeing folk um, that are, um, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just having a little bit of, I can't see myself. So I was like, what's going on? Am I here? I'm here. Okay. Thank you, Mitzel. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I'll have to figure that out later. I will trust, I will trust to the Lord, uh, that you can see me and I will also trust in Mitzel. You, you look Excellent. just 
<laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, so once we get uh, to the right hand, um, this is where we encounter a Black figure, uh, heretofore unnamed, uh, but in the process of our research, uh, we were able uh, oh, to... Oh. I want to just interrupt because I just want to make sure it's clear. This was not research that that uh, this is actually research that Laurel Thatcher Ulrich did to to point us to the name that you're um, that you're going to reference in the in the course of uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's research. Indeed, thank you. And I, I should say, um, you know, by means of um, uh, you know identifying myself that I am a theorist and not an historian uh, and so this has been delightful uh, for me because you know a large part of the theory that I write about identity formation about American identity uh, is dependent on, on the work of historians like um, Dr. Ulrich so thank you so much Emily I much appreciate oh, exactly I mean yes and I get, it goes without saying that that's that's the case for um, you stand on the shoulders of those who came before us in so many respects but um, she did the think back in like the early the early aughts, um, which you're going to speak about. Um, but this is, I think, um, uh, you know, an example of how we've also been able to draw upon the 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 uh, fruitful work of others. Indeed, um, and I mean, it is another nod to the "it takes a village" adage. Um, we cannot. Uh, only rely on one set of approaches and in just the same way we cannot only rely on one era of findings and just in the same way we cannot rely on only one uh, way of uh, rebuilding, reconstructing and healing the archive. Um, and so interdisciplinarity and intergenerational um, understandings of the building of knowledge uh, have been very significant uh, for us uh, during this project. Um, so the, uh, the figure on the right, um, who is uh, now identified as um, potentially being Jane or Jenny Cato, uh, which was one of the, I mean, which was the name of one of the Pundersons enslaved servants. And she served um, as a nursemaid to the baby Prudence, uh, who is depicted in the center, the artist. Um, so the way that the uh, composition is working is to push Jane to the back. Um, she's giving, um, when we first uh, viewed this image together uh, in one of our many uh, curatorial meetings, I, I, I was thinking, wow, she looks very similarly depicted to almost a piece of furniture. Um, you know, relegated to the background, we see that the, the black is an extreme black. Uh, we know that that would have to have been a choice because we also do have brown <laughs> represented um, in the image. And so there is a way in which uh, Jen, Jane, Jenny Cato here is being represented in an iconic um, way affiliated with an absolute blackness. Uh, but yeah. we also I think you say that I just want to interject because we do also see that kind of alignment with objects in the potter over mantle as well, which we'll talk about a little bit further where the child is is kind of treated as part of the furniture. Yeah, yeah that is this image is is unique, but that trope is not um, the idea that uh, black bodies um, were property. Uh, is not just a notion. Um, it is, in fact, uh, one of the guiding rules of interpretation of Black presence um, in the same way that we may think about the cradle here and on the right being present um, and what goes with that cradle. Um, this also, I believe, is a testament um, to the ways in, in which, um, and it was referred to in the, in the previous panel, this idea of um, a family experience of enslavement, an experience of enslavement that is in very close quarters, um, an experience of enslavement that means um, you are not uh, separated off, you are not completely outside, but you are even living, sleeping, eating, you know, participating in the running of a household, including in the raising of children. Um, and some of the works um, that are featured in the show also um, highlight some of the 
uh, precariousness of the situation of a black nursemaid to a white child. Um, you know, what does that um, what does that mean in terms of um, you know, accusations uh, of wrongdoing, accusations even of murder, poisoning uh, of children. What is, where are their anxieties about blackness in proximity uh, uh, to whiteness in these images is another way to think about that. Um, so yeah, it's just a really good point, especially when you think about the history of this work as it's so it's actually, I mean, it's really an icon of American folk art, but also has often been talked about in terms of the domestic interior, and it gets used as an example of, um, uh, you know, how homes were furnished, which I think is just really interesting that that has been an, the sort of an abiding focus for a work like this when it has such an unusual component in it and in showing a black woman in that context. I mean, I can't think of any other works from this time period um, in the British American colonies that actually showed that level of context for the kind of material physical experience of, a, of an enslaved black woman. One of the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit lately, um, as you say that, Emily, is um, I'm teaching a course on James Baldwin, and James Baldwin writes quite a bit about something called, uh, that he, he coins as uh, willful innocence. Willful mm -hmm. innocence means that um, you know what's going on, you know the history, you know the history of slavery, you know that slavery was far more widespread. You may know that racism is far more widespread. You may know that there are structural constructs in place uh, in your name, um, you know, to continue a cycle of oppression and non-freedom. Uh, and yet uh, you wish to, pr to preserve innocence and to say, well, I didn't know anything about it. Um, you know, if I had only known, you know, uh, but I didn't personally do anything. Um, as we're having this conversation about, uh, you know, what has been said in the past about some of these works, we see, I think, um, and I'm thinking more and more about uh, willful innocence as we see folk uh, turning away from the Black figure um, or even uh, accentuating, um, and I'm not saying intentionally, uh, it is the water we swim in, but accentuating the invisibility of Blackness, the invisibility of Black figures, uh, even in how the history is told, even in how an image like this would be analyzed. Uh, for me as a viewer, um, you know, as a, as a Black person, queer, non-binary, but Black, uh, I'm looking at this and I see a Black figure and that is immediately my focus. That is immediately where my attention goes. I know the history. Uh, you know, I know my inheritance, um, but uh, we, we have to, I think, um, really scrutinize uh, and interrogate the ways in which we have been schooled and taught to look at images um, and the things that have been said about those images that encourage us to not see, uh, to not see what is plainly there. Um, and in the, in the way that um, Dr. Ulrich's research uh, you know, identifies this person that it's not just some, you know, oh yeah, and there was, you know, some random slave in the back. No, this was a real living, breathing person with a full story named Jane Cato. And in fact, we find that she pr produced a will. Uh, and in that will, she says um, at the top, I, Jane Cato, I, Jane Cato. Um, that insistence upon identity, that it's insistence upon, um, you know, asserting oneself and saying, no, I am a person. I have things I would like to bequeath um, is, is one of the signs of, um, you know, not only resistance, but self-regard uh, that was utterly necessary. And I'm thinking now about uh, what Dr. Chan shared, you know, how do we continue to keep our, um, our identity uh, uh, intact in spite of all of the ways it is embattled over time. So I would like, uh, if there aren't other, um, I, I know, I, I can't see y'all, so you're gonna have to help me if you want to know, <laughs> but what I will say- We're, we're smiling, we're- 
Amen. Okay. Amen. So what I would like to uh, do now is pass it over to uh, uh, my my other wonderful co-curator, Shade Ayurinde, to talk about uh, this um, Francis Guy image. New York City. Yeah, no, oh, it's so much. <laughs> yeah, I mean this 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 one, I think this one is is really fun and interesting um in terms of you know methodological strategies and um you know what got us excited about this work initially. I mean, yes, the opportunity to talk about New York City since we're in New York City and to um shine a light on the ways that black people were represented in this early moment in such an important place was really huge. And um, Emily and I were at the Brooklyn Museum where one of these works, um, one of these examples is currently on view. And I remember, um, you know, walking by it and it was already on the checklist from like the start. But I think what got us really excited about about it and how we might be able to interpret it was when we were looking at the the key that goes along with it. So um, we so the work is is 1820, as you can see, but there's a key that was developed in the latter part of the of the 19th century, I think 1869. And um, it gives uh, you an opportunity to kind of uh, identify all of the people or most of the people who are in the work. And so thinking about what Arel just said about uh, the sort of ways that we're encouraged to look and how we get the information about how we're supposed to look and um, you know how we're supposed to interpret, that key, I think, really speaks to that. And so our a, a big part of how we wanted to interpret this work was about memory and about how looking back on this work you know decades later who who still stands out as somebody who is important to identify and not and so while um all of the 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 white figures that are that are shown here have a name on the key um many of the black figures don't um some of them are just identified as someone's servant a white one of the white um uh, resident servant, uh, or or not at all. So like the way that that erasure continued into the the sort of latter part of the century. Um, so and I think this this work also did other work for us in terms of um, sort of highlighting some of those stereotypes um, uh, in terms of it, it's. It's so hard to see all the little details, but you have, you know, the 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 cursor sort of pointing to this man who has fallen down in the front, sort of, you know, again, um, as Black people often were in depictions, sort of the um, comic relief for for these images. Obviously, many of them are laboring, um, and so sort of putting them in there, like visually putting them in in their place in society as 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 doing the hard labor of keeping Brooklyn functioning where many of the white people are just, you know, sort of walking around and talking to each other and, you know, kind of some of them seem to be at leisure. Um, and then you just have the, also the size of this work, which is so, so big and really shows how sort of like vast this labor herd was. And the fact that, um, you know, it was, many of the black residents who were responsible for maintaining these giant homes and these roadways and the animals that people were using to eat and to tr transport themselves. So I think, um, yeah, this work was really uh, interesting because we were able to look at two different primary sources that were able to really help us, um, that were the both the image itself and then something about the image that were able to really help us figure out how we wanted to organize it. Um, in sections, but also what we wanted to say about it. I also, yeah, to your point, Shade, I, as I've gotten more familiar with this picture, it's also really striking how it's divided between, so here we have a figure who seems to be the artist because he's carrying a picture under his arm, mm -hmm. so this being Francis guy, but he's sort of walking from one side of the picture to the other, and this side is clearly kind of the uh, all of the figures on this side of the picture are white and we're, we're seeing the sort of um, fancier homes on this side of the picture as well. 
Whereas as where he's walking, he's sort of as an artist walking into the more work a day part of the neighborhood, which um, in which all of the black figures in the picture appear. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of interesting to see that unfold as well. Um, but also too, to think like uh, Francis Guy also painted these pictures of Baltimore that we were just looking at. And so I think it's not coincidental that this particular artist who was not American born, he was English, that he may have had a different perspective, especially with this picture, which is so unusual to actually see enslaved laborers working at, at this time period, um, that he may had, have had a different perspective on American society that led him to more frequently depict black figures um, because we have you know, four examples of his work on the show. Um, and there are others as well. This scene um, uh, looks different to me now in light of uh, the, the, the previous panel just today, uh, when Dr. Ross gave a statistic that I had not heard about, um, about the uh, very high population of enslaved Black folk in Brooklyn. And that's something that I had not I knew that we were there, you know, it's one of those things where uh, uh, that's related to the comment I made earlier about if you look, you will find. Um, and uh, I mean, that's just, it's just stunning uh, to me, the ways in which black presence has been missed. Um, and I use that word uh, not only as by accident, um, but there are very real reasons why uh, folk would not want to know about Black presence in the past, and also reasons why at the time Black presence in the future was being um, uh, segregated and cordoned off. When we think about not being allowed to be buried in a place where you would have lived and worked and served as an American, uh, and having to have a special separate area to be buried, which means then that any markers uh, would not be discoverable uh, for future generations within city limits for the places in which that was. Um, and I'm not being specific to uh, Brooklyn here. I'm, I'm just saying in general, once you segregate um, uh, your dead and you segregate the memorial moment, um, you are looking to the future uh, and, and in, in my view, intentionally misleading uh, folk about who built the cities and who ran them. Um, I will I'm then struck oh, by one what that you just said, RL, that I think um, is really important to uh, to note that you know when you begin looking, you find so much. And I just think um, I'm still struck when we think back to the beginning of the project that one of my primary concerns was that we would not have enough material. Yeah, yeah, and that, that just really is is pretty. Um, striking to think about now, um, given how much material we we would, uh, did end up finding. And I think so much of it was again about looking at works that weren't intended as black representations necessarily, they weren't tended, or they weren't intended to center black representations. Um, yeah. But when you kind of remove that criterion from the list, there is such a huge range of depictions available. Um, and I think, you know, even, I, I also kind of remember early on some questions that we were getting about how we were going to execute this were often, well, how are you going to direct visitors to, to look for these small figures? And how is that going to, how is it going to be clear that this is the subject of the painting? And it was sort of like, well, it's not, I mean, it's not, we're asking, we actually are asking visitors to do more, you know, to, to take an extra leap uh, and do more work uh, than, than they might be used to. But that's part, I think that's an important part of the experience of the show is realizing how hard it actually is to do that looking and then how active you have to be um, when it's not obvious necessarily. And actually, oh, this is such a good segue because the next painting that I have on my list uh, has no people in it at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually was trying to remember recently why we even zeroed in on this as a candidate, because there's just nothing in it that would, I think, immediately lead us to think about this. But 
um, as it turns out, there's a huge, wonderful story behind this picture when you begin to do the research and connections to, to oral histories that we were able to incorporate. Just a quick word on this. Uh, you know, the show is called Black Presence and Absence. Uh, this is, I think, just a perfect example um, of how absence functions uh, for a viewer. It's not only um, that we're looking at, you know, a series of buildings and a, and a, and a, and a green area. We're, we're also, uh, I think, by absence, triggered to imagine who might walk down those streets, triggered to imagine who might live in those homes. And because of the ways in which we have, um, you know, received representations over time, received a hobbled archive, um, received, uh, you know, the the um, the engines, the mechanisms that produce willful innocence, we may be inclined to imagine, oh well, there were white folks living in those homes. This is okay. Where are we? Where are okay? We're in Connecticut. Oh, we in New Milford. Okay, well, those is probably, you know, this is. And I'm not saying even that, uh, that the race of the viewer matters. This is an American issue. This is American history. This is American identity, American representation. Uh, and even I, uh, as a black American, will look at this same image without that knowledge and say, oh, well, you know, I, it, it's work for me to conceive uh, of black presence there. And yet it is uh, emphatically there, uh, as Emily just said, um, you know, which requires then, you know, for us to respect and honor uh, oral traditions, uh, as well as as written ones. Yeah, so for those of you who haven't read about this work in the show, I'll just give a little bit of background. So yes, traditionally, this depiction of the new Milford town green and these house houses and also the general store um, belonging to the Elijah Boardman family. They're usually talked about in terms of the Boardman family. Um, but um, in, uh, and, and you may know the Elijah Boardman portrait, which is at the Met, which features this larger than life depiction of him. And he's standing in front of his desk, which has his account books in them. And then uh, a stack of textiles in a storeroom behind him. So this this building that you're seeing, the buildings that you're seeing on the on the right, I think the building on the far right is the is the store, um, <clears throat> the newly constructed store that a boardman and his brother owned. But those account books were the key to this picture because they survive, and they actually document. Um, you know, they 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 document years of patronage of the shop, including. Um, Black members of the community, both free and enslaved, and in particular, a family named Phillips, who turns up over and over again, um, buying objects of everyday luxury, um, you know, really ex expanding our understanding of their daily lives, but also they were exchanging goods for services with the boardmen. So they seem to have had a working relationship with the boardmans where they were often doing agricultural labor, um, in some cases, work for the town itself. So they are constructing this landscape. They're maintaining this landscape. And they're walking these paths as well. So that resonated when um, Dr. Uh, when Mark Ross brought up the um, the uh, the experience of of the photographer walking through um, the site in Philadelphia and bursting into tears because he could envision his ancestors walking those same paths. I think this picture really has that power. When we hear from descendants of the Phillipses, um, Bonnie Johnson speaks in the oral history that you can listen to on our, um, actually on our digital guide, if you can't make it back into the museum on Bloomberg Connects, you can listen to her speak about her changing experience of looking at this picture and how first just as RL was saying, she sees it and thinks if there were people in this picture, they would not be my people. They would not they would not be African-Americans. And then learning more about the picture transforms her experience of it. And she now speaks about it as giving her a sense of place that this is where her ancestors were from. And she, you know, she herself grew up in New Milford. And so I think this is a really powerful example of how the methodologies, um, of the project can work. Um, anyone want to add anything to 
this picture? Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about. Oh, are you there? Yes. Am I, am I here? Am yes. I here? Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I thought you said. <laughs> sorry. I thought you said something that I couldn't hear. So. Oh no, not at all. Not at all. Um, still trying to find myself, you know, in in this <laughs> life and the next. Uh, but one of the, the um. Uh, the things um, that I just want to underscore, and you all already have been speaking about it, is that um, uh, this is a lot more active uh, than viewers are, are used to getting. Um, and I know when, when we you know, go on with our conversation, we, have, uh, we will have a little bit of time to talk about labels. We will have a little bit of time to talk about um, you know, the design of the, the exhibition itself. Um, but we had to think really uh, quite a bit about um, the fact that this may be some folks' first time uh, doing this kind of looking. I think of it as the first time you look at a magic eye. I know I'm dating myself, uh, but it's a bunch of dots. And if you, you have to relax your eyes in a certain kind of way for the picture underneath the picture, the picture within the picture to appear yeah. to you. Um, okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm the hoping. The response we've had to that though. I mean, I thought, again, there, that was another question. It was like, are, real, are people really gonna want to do this work? Are they really gonna go there? And I've been so, it's been so exciting to see how much people wanna engage with the richness of the available storytelling. It's really wonderful to see um, and hear about folks who've come back to the show multiple times and. Um, I think that's really exciting and also kind of a, you know, uh, a, a note for the future that I think, you know, we, we have standards around museums all have, have standards around label text length and things like that and, and accessibility. And I, I do think it's important though, that we still, you know, we give the visitor as, as much credit as they deserve that they can absorb and understand perhaps more than we might expect sometimes. Absolutely. I mean, the, there have been such fabulous conversations uh, that I've been able to have um, with uh, viewers when, when we opened and we, we were doing, you know, tours and tours and tours and tours and tours. Uh, and it was wonderful because at the end of each tour and sometimes during each tour, there were wonderful reflections uh, from visitors and, and, you know, including folks who are in the industry saying, uh, wow, you know, this is a muscle that I have not used. Uh, but what I also um, can note, you know, just anecdotally from those encounters is that folks uh, testified to, um, you know, feeling like a, another world was opening up uh, mm -hmm. in terms of how they could look at not only the images uh, in unnamed figures, but really any image um, to think about, okay, well, what are some of the, the ways I can actively uh, get involved in this, in this viewing experience and uncover more things that were always there, seek and find, so. Right, yeah. And, and I, I just switched to this. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Chade. No, I was just gonna say, I think that that was, um, you know, one of the, one of our, our um, the things that we really tried to do was to make various entry points for people. Um, and I think, um, that's why including the oral histories, but then um, that people can listen to. But then this work, the the this doll has a whole video that people can can look at and engage with. And then we have photographs that we've put throughout the 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 gallery so that people can consume, um, you know, even more um, sort of primary objects. And we and so I think. You know, and we also we also have artist responses throughout as well. So I think, you know, we we are asking people to do maybe different work, but I think we give them a lot of ways to go about that. It's not just you know here's the image, read the label, and I think that was a really important part of how we put everything together. Yeah, I think those are really good points. This is an exhibit. The doll also, as you said, has um, descendant oral history associated with it. There's a, a, a one other work in the show that has that component. With this work in particular, I think that was really significant. And also the interest that people have had in this work 
has has really been an instance of you know making sure that we um I you know trust that visitors will will have will will have the desire to engage deeply because I remember talking about whether we were going to include this object early on in the process and I was concerned, you know, it is uncomfortable to it's uncomfortable to look at for many because of the crudeness of the facial features engaging with the visual cultures of racism that emerge in the 19th century. Um, and so I had, you know, this is a work that I had thought I'm, I'll write about this for my dissertation, but maybe we shouldn't include it. Um, and then you, both of you, I remember felt really differently about it. And, and so too did the descendants who speak powerfully about, we need to look at this, whether we like it or not, um, I think is the exact quote from Jordan Lloyd, who's a descendant of Darby Vassal, um, because this is still an object of memorial. We know it was intended as a tribute um, made by a white girl. Obviously there are challenges to the way that she executes this. She's obviously taking on board that culture of racism, but she's also seeking to create something very planned out and thought out and carefully executed and carefully preserved too. So there are these tensions embodied in an object like this that um, I think take some time to understand. And it's also just been really um, exciting to see visitors' willingness to engage with a complicated object like this. One of the things that um, we did talk about uh, in our meetings, which uh, honestly, I, I had a great time uh, talking I'm with you all about. Let me just, let's just keep having the meeting. <laughs> yeah, we'll, just, we'll find some business to stand on. We'll find something we to stand on. Find something else. <laughs> it was so generative. It was so generative. This doll, though, in the conversation, and this is even before, um, you know, we got some of the uh, interviews, that audio that accompanied the doll from um, the descendants, um, of the of the family, but there is um, uh, a, 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 what we called a visual vocabulary of racism that settles itself uh, really much later, even in some in some uh, estimates, even after the Civil War, uh, that we start to get like a pretty iconic and and clear set of stereotypes, you know racist archetypes um, and, and the visualizations of same. This doll, uh, however, is I think um, a very interesting case. And it, for me, it was, I was on the, I was on the fence uh, in these meetings. I was saying, I mean, really, I mean, it's not, I mean, you know, I study racism, I study, you know, evil, I study, you know, um, the ways in which American identity has been built um, around uh, these negative and really grotesque and detrimental representations of Black folks, uh, not to mention the exploitation of Black folks, images. Um, and I said, well, I mean, you know, this ain't half, I mean, it's not too, too bad. It's not too, too bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, God bless my, my, my co-curator here who said, I don't know, man, this looks, uh, <laughs> This looks a little more than borderline, and so that that sparked a really interesting conversation. I think about the development of the visual vocabularies of racism and the complexity of the relationship between a maker and the object, between a maker and the subject. In this case, we're we're feeling you know that commemorative desire, the desire to to give honor, and even mis mixed and mingled in that, um, we start to see some of these seeds. Uh, of, of later archetypes that would really explode in grotesque, grotesque fashion. Um, and so I'm delighted uh, that, you know, we got a chance to, um, to show, um, you know, this doll to begin to, to have these kinds of conversations. I know students of, uh, of slavery, students of representation often feel that uh, there was a sort of static level um, of uh, racist representation and you know these archetypes have always been around um, but in fact um, they have not um, slavery itself was a very dynamic uh, system and we see the same dynamisms in uh, uh, post-civil war systems 
uh, Jim Crow systems, uh, new Jim Crow systems, we see the same uh, dynamic living quality uh, to systems of control uh, and, in, and, and in, in representational cases, denigration. So, uh, but I saw that there is uh, a question in here. Let's see, uh, was it relevant that the doll was made by, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, it was relevant. It was relevant. Uh, I do yeah. I think that the fact that this is made by a baby, <laughs> a little child, um, you know, remember it, that you know when we know because because we have this note that descends with the with the doll, we have information about what sort of what her model was. She the the girl who made this, whose name is Mary Saunders. She was a a little a, a girl in a Cambridge a prominent old Cambridge family who's depicting a man who was formerly enslaved in the Vassal House on Brattle Street. And just as an aside, if you didn't see my note earlier during. Um, Alexandra's talk, Darby Vassal was the, the son of a woman enslaved at the Royal House and slave quarters originally, and she moves to Cambridge with Isaac Royal's daughter Penelope, who uh, is gifted um, Cuba Vassal, and Darby is then born in Cambridge. But um, I think important to note that uh, Mary Saunders never met Darby Vassal. It's reflected in this note with the doll that she was capturing a memory that her mother had of seeing one of the men of the Vassal family, although they seem to have confused which man they're talking about, Derby or his father. Uh, they have the dates mixed up. So it's not even that Mary Saunders saw this man herself. She saw, she is, is translating a memory that her mother had. And lest we be confused, all of these families were living within blocks of one another. So it really speaks to this distance, I think, between the Black and white community that was growing at this time in Cambridge. But I think to Liz's question, you know, yes, it is relevant to understand that this was a young girl who made this. And I think um, for us to be able to understand the degree of kind of uh, uh, accomplishment or challenges she may have had with making this, um, I think that adds to our understanding of some of the crudeness, but I also think it makes a statement about how um, how how young people were when they were being taught to absorb these uh, these racist ideas. Um, yeah, there is a um, uh, example, and I know when we get to needle uh, more of the needlework made uh, by children, we'll have an opportunity uh, to reference that which is, um, and I say this all the time, I feel like a broken record. I've taught probably 10 classes this week, so please forgive me. I hope, hopefully I'm not repeating myself now, but what I will say is this, uh, folk like to think that uh, racism is somehow inborn. Uh, folk like to think that uh, there is some merit to the ways in which children uh, mimic the racism of adults. Uh, as though it is um, justified. Uh, there is a justifiable reason, therefore, to believe that Black folk are inferior. Uh, look, even a child understands this. That could not be farther from the truth. Um, this is something that is acculturated. This is something that is um, you know, trained, whether one wishes to train it or, or not. Uh, it's there. Uh, and so, we find uh, that children um, sometimes leak out some of their, uh, some of their, what I would call their sweetness, some of their love of other children by representing the Black children uh, that they grew up close to. Um, there is quite a, quite a bit also in, um, uh, inclu including actually the autobiographies of enslaved and, and self-emancipated uh, folks that talks about this, what, what does it mean um, to be all children together, uh, to play together, to experience one another, and then hit a certain age, and one is enslaved and the other is free. Um, and not only free, but a citizen uh, with the full rights thereof. Um, so the ways in which um, these these connections are depicted um, and the ways in which over time children are taught to see difference and taught to see difference, particular types of difference as significant 
uh, and as something to, um, to not only note, but to act upon, um, you know, is evident, uh, not only in our time, but also uh, in, in, in these artworks made by children uh, and, in, and in, the, um, in the accompanying uh, letters um, that come from, and I don't mean epistles only, I mean like in the realm of American letters, uh, we do find uh, this also, um, and it's tragic. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I, I uh, loved about working with, um, with Emily and with Sade is that we did get pretty deep uh, in these conversations. This is not something that is separate from us. Uh, as uh, you know, scholars, we cannot say, oh, well, I'm not in a body or I don't have a race. I don't have an identity. I don't have a history. I don't have an ancestry. Uh, I know for each um, of us, we have our own relationality vis-a-vis -vis these images, vis-a-vis -vis these ideas. Uh, but there is also an emotional response um, that we had uh, to these images, to these conversations that informed how uh, we put the show together. Um, we, had to, uh, we had to realize that uh, folks were going to have an emotional response to a lot of these, these, um, these images. Uh, and in particular, an emotional response to the way in which we um, are calling them to see things that they might not have otherwise seen. Uh, and so in that way, providing even in the curatorial moment, a mirror, uh, you know, for a, a, an imagined and, and wished for audience, um, I think, I think proved to be very instructive, um, you know, uh, and this doll, I think is, is a really good example of that. We have a question um, from Jacqueline Long about the depiction of dark skin and how that may or may not be a racist uh, component of this. Well, <laughs> what we know, uh, and I, I, we're not the first to know it, uh, is that there are often a lot of times where colors would have been available and black was chosen. Uh, and, and to increase darkness, um, is to increase otherness. It's also to increase a reading of a figure as iconically black. And when I say that, I don't mean just African-American or African descended. I also mean black in the sense of dark times, dark days. Uh, my research um, now, um, and you know, I pray God let, let this book proposal you know, go okay. Uh, but I'm writing now about what does it mean um, to to have the same coloring as the devil? What does it mean to have uh, the coloring of uh, a concept of moral um, evil, of moral just, just badness? Um, and so I don't think when we look at some of these images that are a little bit you know, more darker color that we can leave out the possibility, because I think it is more than a possibility, but it is a probability to read um, a moral failing there. Uh, and we see it in um, not only, you know, Western European iconography, but we also see it um, even in the distant past, um, including the fourth century, but let me not, let me not go on, on this whole thing. Um, but it is, it, is a, it is a live question, um, you know, what is the effect of this? Um, if somebody of my complexion is depicted in, you know, in, in just absolute black, um, that it doesn't matter um, really what my complexion is. What matters is the identity designation and that identity designation comes with all of the trappings of blackness, including those that are not uh, purely aesthetic. Uh, I know we're we're actually coming up on an hour already, believe it or not. So I don't know if we want to focus on um, the Lawsons. If Shade, if you want to talk more about um, this town scene image and the Kara Walker, if there's something else we'd rather finish up with before we start asking folks for their questions, because I want to make make sure we have time for audience questions. 
Well, I've been looking over this, uh, Emily. I'm seeing that we accidentally hopped and answered a few questions from the future. You know, oh, that's, okay. that's futurism in my mind. Come on now. Uh, so what I will say is, um, yeah, either of these seem, would seem to be good. I, I have a feeling seeing how the chat is, is heating up a little bit, um, you know, that we may find even more richness and opportunity to talk about, you know, different parts of the process uh, in the Q&A as well. Yeah, I agree. I think we can, we'll probably end up being able to touch on some of this stuff if we let it flow with what people have questions about, or we can fill in with some of our leftover slides. So I think we can go to questions. Okay, well, yeah, let's see if there are, if there are burning questions on folks' minds now, we can start answering some of those. We've got lots of other slides to share as examples. For some reason, my chat box has gone away. I don't know if anyone else can see. I can see. Um, actually, I don't see anything that we haven't answered in the chat. Carl, but... talking about what you wanted to say about the Vassal doll, right? I think I, I, I may have interrupted you. Oh, you didn't interrupt me. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard. It's hard being an American. You know, this is some of the things that, you know, we, we easily forget. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the whole idea of, um, you know, who gets to be called an American. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to shout out, you know, uh, the fact that there was a large percentage of, of Black participants in the Revolutionary War. Um, we don't get to talk about that. What does that mean um, that we are not including some of these, um, you know, very stark and important, significant presences, Black presences over the course of, of U.S. history um, and in the North, of course, from you know, the 1620s, um, that we are uh, really losing a, the fullness of the picture uh, of not only American history, but American identity. Um, yeah, so. to that point, I mean, we can, we can just take a oh, look yeah. at yeah, examples yeah. of African-American um, soldiers who have contributed to the world of American material culture. Um, some names that are not well known, but should be. Um, John Bush, a pioneering, um, actually indigenous and African descended soldier from Massachusetts who uh, helped to develop this tradition of powder horn carving. I think we also have um, I think we also, oh yes, and we have this portrait of Agrippa Hall, who was a Revolutionary War um, veteran. He was an orderly to General Kozhushko, um, freeborn man of Massachusetts, um, who uh, we have a daguerreotype of, and then also this portrait, which was made of him after the daguerreotype, as we can see, it's a very faithfully copies the daguerreotype. Um, well, we could talk a little bit about portraiture while we're doing this, I think, um, because that evolved to be a very important component of the exhibition when we start to see um, Black subjects come to the center of the frame in the 19th century. I'm going to start talking a little bit about the Lawsons, and maybe folks will have questions about them. And also the response that we got from um, the artist Vanessa German about these works, which I know Shade worked on a series of um, artist yeah. interviews that are incorporated into the exhibition as well. So in addition to those descendant interviews. I actually would love, um, and Shade, if you're willing to talk even just about, um, you know, the uh, the artist Vanessa German's uh, response, because on first glance, uh, these are a breath of fresh air. I know that as we were, as we move through uh, the show, and I know we'll have a couple of pictures of the installation uh, available shortly as well. But um, as you move through the show, it is a moment of relief to see these two um, uh, portraits uh, of uh, Nancy and William Lawson. Uh, after seeing 
um, you know, representations that either left much to be desired um, or just were, there was just complete experience of absence or on the other hand, an experience of, um, you know, really unfortunate uh, episodes in history. Um, and so coming to this moment seems a positive moment, but I know that it has been, um, you know, I think very helpfully uh, problematized um, by the artist. So I'll, I'll actually seed the ground uh, on general reflections to, uh, to Sade. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think Vanessa's response to these is really was really important to include because I do agree that the way that these works have been interpreted has um, usually been to celebrate this, the pictures of, of these two as though this is a, a shining example of, of Black people being able to um, make, you know, choices their own choices about how they want to be represented and um, that it's really cool that it was a, a white artist who was willing to do this. Um, but when Vanessa German was looking at these, she sort of had a different take and she was wondering about whether or not this was truly the way that the couple wanted to be represented or if these choices were a performance to some degree, like having these, um, you know, having the sort of setting and the clothing and the poses and the objects that they're, that they're holding in particular, like the book, which, you know, is a pretty typical portrait prop. She wondered if that was a way to stay safe. If you're going to have your portrait painted and you do have the means to do it and you can find somebody who will do it for you, um, especially if you're posing in front of a, a white artist, are there ways that you have to behave or ways that you have to show yourself or ways that you have to dress yourself um, or um, styles that you have to adhere to that are that are maybe outside of the way that you would absolutely want to be shown just so that you can um, play a role that you need to play? And is that a part of safety for 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 these two? So I I think um, while there while there can always be and will always be multiple ways to interpret um, you know when we don't know for sure, um, it's I think it was really important though for us to let that idea shine through as an alternative way of of seeing these works because it's a very true thing that a part of of any um, Black person's lives then and frankly now is all about how it is that you're able to fit into spaces and do it in a way that allows you to be as comfortable and as safe as possible. I mean, the questions uh, about uh, the history of assimilation as a defensive mechanism, uh, I, I found really helpful. Um, you know, uh, thank you, Shade, for hitting on this, the concept of safety. Uh, you know, so we have to begin to think about agency, I think, in a little bit more complex and nuanced way. Um, so yes, of course, this, it, there is agency here. Yes, they did say, okay, yeah, we would love to have our, you know, we, we want these paintings made, we're going to sit for them. Uh, but in what ways are we performing? Um, one of the things that I, I study quite a bit is this idea of double language um, and signifying. Uh, shout out to the research of Henry Louis Gates Jr., uh, or as my colleague calls him, uh, HLG the God. Uh, one of the things that um, um, you know that I've, I've learned from you know reading his work and theory is that things are not always what they seem. And I think things are intentionally not what they seem. And some of the means of uh, uh, communication have to be uh, you know, at cross purposes with, with whatever the standard is. So everything from standard English uh, you know, to signifying, um, you know, and this is of course taken from the classic essay, the signifying monkey. 
Um, but also this idea uh, comes into play for me visually here um, as we see, um, you know, as Sade mentioned, tropes that would be common in portraits of white folk. Uh, and yet, um, you know, to, to focus on the image on the right of William Lawson, I know that Emily also uh, pointed out that um, the fact that he has a lit cigar um, a lit cigarillo, you know, he in his bag um, is is not quite as common. Um, I would even I've actually never seen another example of that in 19th century portraiture. So very oh, uncommon. So possibly hot box, <sighs> which is giving blackness to me, um, you know, in in the way that we are styling ourselves. And this goes back to Dr. Momon's um, uh, you know, comments about dressmakers and how their talents, um, you know, would, would make their way into runaway notices uh, when they would self-emancipate and they would say, oh, this person is going to be elaborately dressed. They're going to, yeah. but, but we cannot think about that as something that is given to them entirely by their enslaver. Uh, we cannot also make an assumption that there is not speech happening even when it looks like it's um, you know falling into a standard uh, for black presence or a standard for black appearing. Um, so it does. I think um, you know my hypothesis is if we can get ourselves into a habit of looking at subtleties, uh, differences of difference, um, we may be able to find um, you know these really really hot spots of, of self expression. Uh, and agency. Uh, the subtlety is mandated um, by the by the uh, the the societal situation um, and the status situation, uh, and yet uh, it is there. So, um, so I think we see. I think we see that in her portrait as well, especially if you look at it in comparison to other portraits from this time period by this white artist. Um, I, she's made a lot of decisions um, to um, that seem very individual to me um, with respect to actually we have um, uh, Elizabeth Humphrey on uh, in the panel to or in the audience today and I, I would I would love to uh, know more from her because I know she's worked with this picture in exhibition um, in the past as well. But there's just so much that is so over the top with this. It maybe doesn't read as much to us today, but her the voluminousness of her costume and the ribbons and all of the different lace patterns and the intricacy. And um, this is just an extraordinarily elaborate um, representation. Uh, and I think, you know, knowing that the Lawson's intentionally made that choice because they would have had to pay for it. Um, as we talked about, and we know prior as an artist charged different prices according to what his patron, the level of um, polish or um, detail that the sitter requested. And so um, this this picture of her in particular is at the would have been at the top of his price range, I think. Um, to have something with this amount of um, specificity. Um, also interesting that he, uh, we know William Lawson, who is a, a Bostonian, he was a clothing dealer, um, which was a profession that was open to um, uh, middle-class Black uh, Bostonians at this time. And um, probably the clothing that he was dealing in was not as nice as this, but I think um, maybe also speaks to his profession uh, that they choose to really highlight her, her dress. So we uh, do have three questions now um, in the chat. So maybe we can try to get through those uh, before the close out. So the first one is, are there any examples of mixed race portraiture? And if so, are they named? And I don't know if you know of any, Emily, like outside of the exhibition, but in yes. yeah. the exhibition, go ahead. Well, I, yeah, no, I think um, even within the exhibition, I don't have photographs of this, but Paul Cuffey is an example of someone who was of 
African and Wampanoag ancestry, um, a Massachusetts sea captain who becomes a very successful businessman as well, living in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, sorry, I don't have examples of that, but we have a, a pair of images. One is a silhouette cutout of Cuffy, and we, we know that this is of him. Um, but because of the nature of a cutout profile, we actually um, we don't we don't see his complexion in that image. Uh, there's another image which has long been referred to as an image of Paul Cuffey that's in the show, but it, it is not. Um, uh, there really is a lack of evidence to confirm that identification. Um, the man in the portrait does seem to possibly be um, of. Uh, multiracial heritage, um, but we actually only have very circumstantial evidence to connect that particular image to Paul Cuffey, um, and we use it in the show as an example of um, kind of the hunger to identify and to add names, um, even when we don't have certainty. Um, but yes, especially in Massachusetts and other parts of New England, there is a, a relationship strong relationships between indigenous and um, uh, African descended communities that result in marriages um, frequently because the status of the child follows the status of the mother. Black men would marry indigenous women, um, which was also the case with Paul Cuffey, whose father was, uh, was African born and whose mother was Wampanoag. Um, so good question. I don't know if either of you have, have anything else that's coming to mind. Nothing else um, came to mind for me, um, especially not anything named or anything that we for sure, there may have been some speculation about mixed race, but we weren't for sure. Um, somebody like sort of following up on that was asking was the question, are there portraits of mixed race people or portraits of two people of different races in the same image and aren't those folks at technically mixed race. And I, I kind of wondered the same thing about um, mixed race, meaning the individual pictured or two, like, you know, um, two differently raced people. Um, but to, if the question was, are there two differently raced people, um, like as like a couple in an image, then in the show, then no. That's much more unusual, though we do have examples. There was a portrait, a double portrait of two, um, two, uh, two young girls, which sold at Christie's in, I think, 2022 um, in January, which made quite a stir. Um, uh, but we don't know exactly where the, that picture came from. We're not sure where it was made. Um, or what the history is of, you know, who those two girls were and what their relationship was to one another. Um, there's also a suite of portraits by William Matthew Pryor where um, we have, you know, the mother and the father and a, and a brother and then a sister who appears to be herself um, of mixed race heritage, although the other members of the family are, are seemingly depicted as white. So Pryor was an interesting um, because he seems to have had abolitionist sympathies himself. Um, he was someone who um, we see depicting people of um, African heritage on, on multiple occasions. Um, so hopefully that answers uh, a, a, a something of the questions that were raised. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing some follow-up where the Coker brothers of mixed race. I mean, I think there was a, there was a lot of there are a lot of instances of uh, multiracial heritage throughout because often of enforced sexual relationships between enslaver and enslaved, and also, as I said, um, intermarriage between indigenous and African descended um, communities. Um, One thing I gotta say uh, real quick is um, I, I have a quote. Um, and I believe Baldwin says his grandmama said this. His grandmama was one of his aunties. And they said, um, white folks don't hate blackness. They hate black people. Because if they hated blackness, then they would only discriminate against dark-skinned blacks. But black people are white as them. And 
as soon as they are known to have had African ancestry, they are discriminated against. It is a category that is apart from color uh, in many ways. And so we see this uh, in the past and, you know, Emily just referenced, um, you know, the, the rampant sexual violence. I mean, I, I cannot overstate it. Um, I have white blood uh, just as much uh, as quite a lot of African-Americans. And when we see, um, I mean, an ancestry. So when we see even the pictures uh, that you put up, uh, Emily, of the, the descendants of um, Sib Hall, that idea of, um, well, are these, are these really black folk came up on the tour? Uh, we were talking quite a bit about, um, yo, oh, you thought you were looking at a white lady, didn't you? You did. Um, it's a little clearer now because you know it's on our, it's on your screen. But when you're seeing it on the wall, um, and you may be at a distance, you're not expecting. Oh wait, no, these are these are black folk. Um, and so the question about mixed race, you know, makes me think. Uh, you know that that you know we're a little bit delulu uh, in the United States of America. We're a little delusion. Uh, we do believe in bloodlines that never existed and uh, never have been. Uh, we believe sometimes in a racial purity that is, you know, by the very nature of DNA, inaccessible at any time. Uh, and so there is a kind of accidental nature uh, to the way that discrimination unfolds on the basis of color. Uh, but definitely in the time period that we are looking at, um, uh, and even through to, I would say, to the end of the 19th century, arguably through till today. Um, once you are identifiably Black, um, whether you say so or whether, you know, you have a phenotypical, you know, betrayal happening in your face, uh, it's on and popping in terms of how, you know, racism is going to unfold in and, and constrict your life. Um, and so, you know, the, the question about what happens, you know, with, with mixed race, race folks, you know, in some ways that we are anachronistic when we think about what it means to be mixed race, um, uh, because the, the foundations on which, uh, you know, we lay the construct of race today really has uh, evolved, even though it is fulfilling the same patterns of the past. Uh, we do have a question from Elizabeth Humphrey. Um, thank you for your productive conversation. For all of you, how did you reconcile your personal perspectives and or lived experiences with the overarching goals of the project or the needs of your audiences? Great question and definitely one that um, uh, I think we all spent time thinking about um, quite a bit. Either of you. Well, you know, I'm gonna just say this right now, I'm black. Um, if you didn't know, I apologize um, <laughs> uh, for not making myself known sooner. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm only partially kidding uh, because sometimes as scholars, we can think, uh, you know, I love this question because sometimes we can think we're outside of something. Oh, I am the eye above and I'm looking down into this. Uh, that is a fallacy. I'm in my body and incidentally, my mind is also made of matter inside my body in need of the same nourishment, in need of the same care as the rest of my body. And so then that therefore means that my lived experiences cannot be left behind. Um, and so, you know, in accounting for that, uh, and I, I know other scholars that sometimes think of this as, as the moment of handicap. I don't think this has been anything other than a boon, um, you know, and I will, I will defer to, you know, my co-curators, you know, to talk about their own experiences. But I have found that the fact that we Black and White are able uh, to, uh, to talk about the ways in which um, we have uh, experienced in the, in the present day um, some of these uh, inheritances of the past. Um, and I mentioned a little bit earlier the ways in which our emotional response uh, to doing the research and, you know, really tarrying with one another, um, you know, as we, as we process, okay, well, what does this mean then uh, for the project? What does this mean then for presenting this uh, you know, to a wider audience in a responsible way. 
uh, I have really thought that um, uh, that that was an advantage. Uh, our personal experience of being in the bodies we're in in the country that we are currently in, um, and then experiencing that in its fullness and not not separating it, not divorcing it from inquiry, but using it um, as a vehicle, uh, you know, for not only the design, but also, you know, the interpretations uh, of what we were looking at. This idea Hartman has been very important for us um, and, and her ideas about how do we, um, how do we rebuild uh, some of these stories? Um, and, and that requires imagination. And if you do not have the imagination um, to begin to reconstruct, that is of course coming from your lived experience, um, it can be very difficult uh, you know, to do this kind of work where it's not laid out for you already. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think, uh, especially with what Ara was just saying, the two, the two of us, because of the work that we do already being so much into representation, Black representation and stereotype. And um, I think our approach to so many of the works was like, oh yeah, like A, we should, we should show it, we should definitely show it. Like we when we were talking about the doll earlier, and um maybe taking a little bit of extra time to kind of um process um how audiences would see it, because I think RL and I are so used to looking at images like this and again with it being so much a part of our lived experience our daily experience of understanding ways that we can be seen by other people and interpreted by other people um we I think it took a, just a couple of, you know a little bit of extra time to think about how these images would appear to other people that were not us that were not already you know scholars in this in this area um so I do, I do think that it 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 was a big part of um, how we tried to think about the labels and make it a multimodal experience. Um, you know, just recognizing that um, not everybody was going to approach these images the way we do, and have um, not so much like um, like just not as much exposure and not, and not understanding them the way that we understand them. So I think that was a really important part of, um, sort of coming to terms with how we were going to display the works and how that was going to function in the design. Yeah, I think for me, I, um, I mean, I remember when I first started researching what would become the central, uh, introductory case study for the show, as part of my coursework at the University of Delaware, um, I actually, I mean, I, I, I remember thinking is, what does it mean for me as a white woman to be seeking to tell these stories and how can I make sure that I am not, um, you know, that I'm approaching that ethically and um, uh, opening space for, uh, historical black voices to to be centered that it's that it's my my own perspective and positionality are not over overbearing but I also think that my my it's and in particular as a, as a northeasterner my my um experiences growing up in New England have been um really relevant for how I've approached the project just in terms of uh, an awareness of kind of that absence of um, Black stories that was so prevalent in my own. I mean, I, I just continually um, horrified to realize how many uh, names were absent in my own early education. I think in particular with the stories of the Vassal doll, because I did grow up in Cambridge, right? down the street from where Darby Vassal lived and was buried. And none of that was part of the sort of local public discourse or the curriculum. And so, um, you know, for me as a historian, art historian of New England, I think, um, uh, especially someone who's often taking a lens of kind of memory making and looking back from the lens of the era of the colonial revival, like, 
the my growing understanding and doing that research of how whitewashed those histories were was a big part of what brought me to the project. Um, and I think also informed how I knew, um, you know, some of the things that I knew would put, would be especially surprising and uncomfortable for uh, many of our audiences to learn about. Um, so, I, but I also think just it was important to all of us to have a really collaborative approach to the project and to be, I think, you know, trust and openness amongst the three of us throughout has been so important. Um, that, to kind of just allow us all to speak openly about our perspectives and wouldn't have been possible without our friendship. Yeah, say that. Actually, this is a great segue, if I might, if I may. Uh, this is from, uh, oh, I can't, this is so small. Um, uh, Kalina, I think. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but it says, oh my God, you hope you end up in my class? I hope so too. I hope so too, child. <laughs> okay. It says, in what ways has bell hooks theories on dominance come up in the ways that I view racialized American art. Um, this uh, comment that uh, Emily just made about how important it has been for us to trust each other, how important it has been for us to uh, be unafraid in our communication uh, with each other um, and, and to sit with it, uh, as Sade mentioned, just to, okay, well, let's sit with this for a minute uh, and think about how it can go. Um, so uh, I just am going to read a quick quote, uh, and this is from All About Love. It says, cultures of domination rely on the cultivation of fear as a way to ensure obedience. In our society, we make much of love and say little about fear. Fear is not how, uh, how we need to end. We may be fear, we may, we may be fearful, we may have trepidation. This idea of dominance to, to, to look at difference itself as a reason for fear, to look at difference itself as a threat. Uh, and this, that's bell hooks, um, you know, ideas of how dominance is functioning, um, you know, using, um, you know, fear, trying to trigger fear in this case, visually in a viewer, uh, by showing difference is represented in our section um, that deals with the most grotesque representations of Black people, with the, the, the types of representations that you go, ugh. Uh, I did uh, once upon a time, um, you know, in one of the like, you know, uh, pigeonholes of my graduate school life, uh, a little bit of research into disgust and things that incite disgust, things that incite a, 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 re, a viewer to recoil. Um, it is in that recoiling uh, that we see the activation of a fear. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be near that, uh, but also um, that uh, is an expression of dominance, that there are going to be things then that I, um, that I react uh, more kindly to. I have a nice little warm feeling about it. Uh, and so that, that sets us up um, in such a way that I think it is part, a very important part of the upbringing of a lot of American children where they're looking at representations that are triggering those kinds of responses in them and attaching color, attaching identity, attaching race, attaching gender, whatever the, the, the label may be for a group of people, attaching it to an emotional response triggered by a representation. And that, that is, I think, a very um, uh, bell hooks description of how dominance works. Um, I think is very is very active um, and reasonable to apply there when we look at um, the ways that we have been enculturated uh, to hate one another and not to love one another. Thank you so much, Arvel, to um, end and close our program on, on this word and, and the work of Bell. Um, it was really amazing to have you three together and thinking expansively about the lives of um, African-American 
across time um, and also to think about ways to undermine um, legacies of slavery. So it was really uh, incredible to end with you three. And also I would like to thank uh, you three for this incredible exhibition that is on view until March 24th. Um, and I would like also to thank all our panelists today and two weeks ago, because we had a very, very um, rich and, um, and also instructive um, symposium that I think, and I hope will inspire everyone here on the call to uh, think differently and look, reconsider historical, historical objects and, and, um, and material culture.